you have to use this. Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop, uh, which is being organized by JustNet Coalition, which is a coalition of uh, about 36 organizations from across the world, uh, which uh, work towards a just uh, and equalitarian uh, internet. Uh, you can look us up on the website, search for Just uh, Net Coalition. Uh, and uh, our co-organizers are Association for Progressive Communications. You would know them well. And Software Freedom Law Center, who is, uh, who is represented on the panel here by Mishi. So let me start uh, this panel on making artificial intelligence work for equity and uh, social justice with uh, some initial remarks, after which I'll pass you on to the panelists who will make five minute interventions before we open uh, it to all of you for uh, comments. Okay, sorry, my colleague tells me that if your audio is not good, you can use those things to put to your ear, uh, which will uh, uh, make things louder for you. Um, so, okay, uh, the intention of this effort uh, of organizing this workshop uh, is to discuss artificial intelligence, not in technical terms, uh, but as a social construct. Uh, and today there is a lot of confusion about what exactly somebody means when they mention artificial intelligence. Uh, and among the businesses, you would have heard that so-and-so business have started using artificial intelligence and others are yet not using artificial intelligence and they generally mean a specific kind of technologies uh, which probably a machine learning is what they mean that they have started using it other people use it more broadly it's a good uh, term to market themselves by saying we are using artificial intelligence so technologies change uh, but what we are interested in is artificial intelligence having emerged as a huge social force and we try to reclaim here in this workshop artificial intelligence as a social construct and not as a technology. Uh, data analytics also does diagnosis, does predict things. Data mining, there's machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, what all these things do is that they use data to find patterns. And on the basis of those patterns, it gives insights which can be used as intelligence to organize human affairs. So that's what is actually happening. So we need to, this is happening for a long time. There was a time when you, you would not call, for example, when you're typing into your laptop and there's an autocomplete, this is also some kind of insight they have based on data. People won't call it artificial intelligence in modern times. That looked very intelligent at that time. Uh, my colleague was telling recognition of optic characters was very big at some time. So basically, we are not interested in how the technologies are evolving. We are interested, but that's the infrastructure. Technologies may change. We may have something beyond neural networks, uh, which would be even more intelligent. So we are not talking about artificial intelligence as a technology. But what we are talking about is that we have reached a time when insights and intelligence based on data has become so powerful and so intelligent that it does not just aid human beings in decision making, but it has taken a kind of a force of its own. It's not used just for one-off operations, but organizing a whole lot of operations in such a manner that the whole social organization from economy to governance uh, to social relationships may get reorganized on the basis of this intelligence which is derived from data. I have called this to distinguish it from the technical term intelligence, artificial intelligence, as digital intelligence in some of my papers. But what we are talking about is data-based intelligence. So that's the construct we are talking about, that which is now so powerful that it is reorganizing all kinds of human relationships and human uh, organizations, including the economy. Now we know China and US are being said to be in an AI race. I mean, we know that when you talk about an AI race, then that must be huge. Uh, Putin says that whoever controls artificial intelligence would control the whole world. And people like Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates have given very dire warnings about what can happen if we do not uh, kind of do something about this technology. So we are talking about that 
particular social phenomenon here and not any piece of technology. So that's how we, this workshop would like try to reclaim the term artificial intelligence and not as just a set of technologies. The second part of the name of the workshop is equity and social justice. And again here, we treat it as a structural concept. It's not something that you have systems working and once they're working, then you recognize oh, what is the kind of injustice it's creating and have a residu residual strategy to correct that. Uh, we want the system as they are built to be built with a design that social justice and equity is a part of that system. And that's again, an effort of this workshop. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about there should be basic income because people are getting out of jobs, which is very important, but I think that's not enough. That's a very residual way of addressing the nature of artificial intelligence, preponderance, preponderant uh, tendencies towards creating social injustices and inequities. We want the whole system of artificial intelligence and how it reorganizes human affairs to be developed in a manner so that the system as it works itself is fair and just, and it allocates resources and dividends uh, in a just manner. So with these thoughts, uh, I would now pass you on to the panelists. And first uh, would be Juan Carlos from Dericos Digitalis, which is a Chile-based organization working on digital rights. Uh, to you, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Parminder. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this workshop. Uh, to introduce a bit of what we do and why we are here, Derechos Digitales is a digital rights organization. Uh, we are based in Santiago, as, as, as it was mentioned. And what we do is mostly uh, try to defend human rights as related to the use of technology. And this, is, uh, this is, has many consequences regarding where does this come from, where does this go, uh, what is the use of technology that is respectful of human rights, and what can we do about it as, as people. Sometimes we find that we have to use this or that technology to protect ourselves, but sometimes the problems that we find are much deeper than that. And this is one reason why uh, social justice is, is an important factor of the things that we do, and why uh, while we started thinking about digital rights as the individual rights uh, taken to technology, the truth is that the so complex problems in society have much deeper roots and have much different forms of solution in case we want to reach those solutions. This starts, uh, of course, with the idea of social justice and equity as, as, as the determining factor or the goal that we want to reach. Uh, the truth is that if it's true that uh, artificial intelligence and technology is part of society, if it's true that uh, it's a social construct, then it's part of our society also to determine which are our goals and which are the tools for those goals. Coming from Latin America, having a Latin American perspective, well, what we see in the field of artificial intelligence is often the use of a marketing term uh, that is used uh, to sell some technologies that have already set up uh, its most relevant uh, features for, it, for their use, for the implementation, without necessarily being influential in their design or in the data that they gather or the results that they present. So in that sense, uh, the disconnect between our level of development and the development of these tools becomes uh, all, the more, uh, all the more grave. Um, and in this sense, uh, we might be, as developing countries, again, just clients of a certain market. But the truth is that because we are having this kind of technology that can process large amounts of data and that can be used to make decisions based on that data, um, what we find is governments uh, and companies uh, finding in technology solutions to problems that were not necessarily the problems that society may uh, find. So to go back to the idea of social justice and equity, um, uh, and if we do not study the premises behind the design of artificial intelligence systems, what we find is another version of, of techno-solutionism where we uh, rely on technology to solve problems. But social problems can have only social solutions and not technological solutions. In this sense, uh, what we find is that what we need to empower is not only uh, the idea of having better technologies, but the idea of influence, of seeing the development of technology and the deployment of technology as a matter of 
participation, as a matter of citizenship, and as a matter of uh, involvement in those deep decisions. If we want to solve social justice, by whichever tool we want to find, we need to correctly identify which are our social priorities. AI can be helpful in that, in maybe finding the patterns, in maybe finding the, the sources of certain problems that we might not have seen from uh, existing sources or, or through findings that by only human effort might take a ridiculously large amount of time. But to get to that point, we still need to, as, as with any other technology, to look into society as the source of the, of the answers to the question about what is the problems that we are trying to address and what measures do we need to take in order to achieve social justice and how do we measure when we have gotten there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we just took four minutes and we would want you to come back again and tell us more. Uh, and now our uh, next uh, speaker is Norbert Bolo, who is... Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, Robert Bolo is the next speaker, who is a coordinator of JustNet Coalition, and he would try to give a little technical input to this proceedings about what kind of things artificial technologies are and what can they do or not and what can they be made to do. Uh, Norbert, please. Thank you. Now, looking at this AI thing as a social phenomenon, there's a technical core behind it, and that's what I want to try to give us some very brief and much simplified grounding, which I propose to use for the purpose of this workshop. Now, the term artificial intelligence, it's the opposite of natural intelligence, which is meant to refer to the kind of intelligence that we have as humans and that animals also have to some extent. And this natural intelligence, um, you know very well, it's very much developed by learning. We receive huge uh, throughput of data through our eyes, through what we hear. And as we process this data, we learn to recognize patterns. And through recognizing those patterns, we learn many things. In a way, the human intelligence works like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Different from a muscle, it can learn to do very different things. This, this muscle which pulls my arm, it can only pull my arm. Maybe it is weak, maybe it is strong, but it cannot do very much different things. The human intelligence can learn to do very many different things. Chinese is very different from German and so on. We can learn many different things. Now, talking about artificial intelligence, I would propose to think about it very much simplified again as something that can recognize patterns and on the basis of those patterns generate a human readable output or make something happen. For example, um, on the basis of some patterns in language that someone types in a social network post, decide to make that post visible to many or only to very few people, or on the basis of data about a natural person, decide whether that person is going to be a profitable customer and make them a good offer, or the, maybe that person looks like a risky customer or someone not likely to have much money, give them a very bad offer only or the famous example of a self-driving car, there is something inside which, depending on patterns like a red light or a green light and certain markings on the street, will drive or not drive and so on. So these are systems. We speak about artificial intelligence systems. They have many components. I want to briefly highlight two types of components one which I call algorithmic components. That is something like a traditional computer program. They may be very complex, but an algorithmic component is based on a programmer understanding some kinds of patterns and programming the computer to recognize them and take certain actions. 
using just algorithmic components, you can program a computer to play chess. It will not likely play terribly well, but it can play chess because that is algorithmic. On the other hand, in recent times, the computer hardware got well enough that also a different type of component has become practically feasible. I would contrast them to the algorithmic components by saying an algorithmic component is based on being inspired how humans think consciously, how humans reason or doubt, how humans decide to explore something in more depth, think more moves ahead in chess. That's all inspired by conscious thinking. Now we are at the time where it becomes possible to build something that works similar to unconscious processes of a brain. This is called neural networks. And neural, this kind of uh, technology has made it possible to build systems that do not only recognize patterns that the programmer understands, but to recognize new patterns that no human has ever articulated consciously before. This can be very powerful. The disadvantage is you need lots of data to train those computers enough so that they recognize the patterns and recognize them in such a way that they will know which patterns are important for generating the desired outputs. Of course, you have to tell that artificial intelligence system that uh, you want certain types of outputs. You want to maximize your profit or whatever. Typically, uh, the goal of a social network company is to maximize advertisement profits. So this gets put into the system, and then the system <coughs> figures out the patterns that, will, that it will then recognize. So this needs lots of data. It's one restriction. If you have a problem where you don't have lots of data to train it, this will not work. And the other restriction is you need to have a precise definition of what you want to optimize. You can optimize your profits. You cannot use an AI system to optimize social good because you can't put that into a number. Thank you. workshop will figure out to put social justice in a number and put it in artificial intelligence and that's uh, the kind of regulatory objective uh, the society may have to develop uh, now next uh, speaker is uh, Mishi Chaudhary who's also a co-organizer of this workshop from software freedom law center and she will place this technical understanding which Norbert gave us into more of a social uh, setting Mishi please thank you um, <coughs> I think um, in the coming year, um, VCs who all invest like lemmings are not only going to invest more in cryptocurrencies, but we all know anything which will have the magic marketing term, artificial intelligence, is where the money is going. So, but apart from the hype, there are already real world examples um, around all of us in which we can see how big data plus machine learning is changing society around us. For the last five years at least, um, we have watched the technology which is responsible now for making a lot of healthcare decisions around us. It's um, deciding whether prisoners should go free. I'm sure some of you at least followed ProPublica's um, investigation of North Point. Um, it also determines what we see on the internet. That perhaps is the closest to all of us in the room, even if we haven't noticed where it's uh, creeping into our rest of our lives. When it predicts, it tells you what you want to watch online. Recently, we've also seen the ability of um, use of similar technology to create different kind of videos and audios, which seem so close to reality that it is very difficult to understand what is exactly where. 
I'm, I don't know if you are like me, um, interested in wasting time on YouTube, then you perhaps have seen the videos where the um, horse turns into zebra with the stripes or where one Redditor used celebrities um, in a video, a pornography video, where it looks like they were the actual people. It distorts a reality and it does offer some kind of creativity, but it also creates a dystopia and a utopia in the same vein. Now, um, I think but in what we're also realizing, um, a little late, but uh, definitely for the political climate is helping us realize is, that the human society is going to permanently shift because of the power we are vesting in the robots. This is not um, just the science fiction and uh, it's not the extreme of everybody's job is going to be lost. Let's talk about universal basic income, which is what Silicon Valley likes us to talk in those terms. But this is slowly moving about various things we do in everyday life into um, the network. Um, no wonder we are uncomfortable with the ability to automate decision making, but because, because it's challenging not only what the role of the unskilled labor would be, but also a lot of experts. We've seen how this changes democracy, how it changes our pattern and behavior. Um, because um, if you watch the companies, everybody wants now to know that they are AI first and everything else later. And this is not just the platform companies, these are the companies who provide you food, food tech, agricultural companies, everything which touches our uh, lives. Not everything is bad. Um, for the longest time, the researchers thought that uh, better algorithms will produce better results. But what has changed now, they understood that it's about data sets. The data sets are the ones which produce very different results. And this paradigm shift which happened because of the image net thinking, that is what is fueling the uh, development in AI. Now, we are all creating enough of behavior and data sets every day to be fed into this system. And that's what we are helping make the systems better in various ways out here. The purpose of the workshop is not to talk about just tech, but how it impacts the society in general. So, if this is already happening, it's happening all around us. You're not going to all sit out because a lot of times it's happening where places you don't even know and you would actually like some of more machine learning to be there because it just helps you live a better life. Then what do you do at such points? Um, the first thing is you do demand transparency. It's not enough, but you do want transparency. Earlier, we all talked about free and open source software for all this time. Um, the code which you cannot read, you can never trust. If, you, if the machine, what is in this machine, I cannot read, I cannot trust. Now you combine that with data, and that all works together intricately into proprietary technologies, which, no, which is not open to anybody. Sometimes it said, oh, it's too complicated. Second time it said, oh, the data is the one which we own. We will perhaps give you the software, but the inferences and the data is something which we want to keep because every, that's why you have all these free tools which the companies are ready to give you, but not the data. That's why I think the most important thing to demand is transparency, which will enable a lot of participation. You cannot leave it to the academics or the companies because um, even in this uh, setting, Look at all the civil society organizations who come and participate here. It's only very recently we are seeing a lot of people who have been active traditionally deciding about what social justice is were not active in this space. If it took them so long and we, they're still not here, what will happen if we all are not participating in what is now being determinative of our lives later on? You have seen at least in 2017 itself, there have been at least six major big groups which have now come up, which are right now looking into what either ethics would be of AI or what people would be and research. This is just a precursor because uh, self-regulation by companies is always what comes first before codified law comes. Law comes much later, politicians join a little later to the party, but self-regulation comes first. 
Now, if 2017 is what we saw, the formation of these companies, we are going to now start seeing the results in 2018, 2019. So I'm not saying we're already late, but it's already time to start participating, demanding the transparency. The other thing which I just want to say is that um, coming from a different part of the world, I do practice in New York as well as I, uh, in New Delhi. Um, in some parts of the world, technology is still very fascinating. When you look at something, when it can tell you this is my face, and it can suggest in a photograph that you should be tagging such a thing, it's a very fascinating to somebody whose first interaction with computer is a small device. It's not the same as someone who grew up on computers and who hasn't leapfrogged into this generation. So a lot of people who are unconnected and coming online for the first time, they still think of this as big magic and they're very fascinated. The uh, narrative in a lot of these countries is innovation trumps everything. Governments want and now are selling that everything subservient to innovation. Government want to move fast and break things, thereby forgetting a lot of traditional um, values of democracy, social justice, and equity, which it has taken generations for us to build. But because innovation is most important and economic development is the base, major goal, it's easy to ignore all of these. Um, I would say a, a few other things, but I think my time is running. But um, I, I do want to stress upon that our role in building intelligent data sets that can teach the machines to develop this kind of artificial intelligence cannot be underscored or emphasized enough. There's an opportunity to create a full spectrum of training sets that reflect a richer portrait of humanity with inclusivity and diversity. Because right now, it's only few kind of human beings who are, right, who are making those data sets or who already have the privilege to be using the tech are the ones who are going to be teaching. So if skin color, if culture, if gender, if various other things which we think is what make the human race are not even being reflected in the data sets, we're really far away from what the machine will actually learn and then spit it out. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mishi. Uh, in the second part uh, of the workshop, which we would soon move to after two speakers' interventions, we are going to focus on what can we do about it, because this is a framing of the issue uh, about what is the problem, but as social justice activists, we are very interested in actually being able to do about things. About things. So we are going to get into that discussion soon. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, the next speaker is Pritam Malur from ITU, which as you know is an intergovernmental organization. And he will describe the kind of spaces that are already getting built in international policy uh, venues uh, for these discussions, uh, because we need to reach these discussions to the policy venues. There isn't much time. Thank you, and Preetam, please. Thanks, Parminder, and uh, of course, thank you for the invitation. So this is a, a topic of personal interest uh, for me, uh, because before I joined the ITU, and I've been here for 10 years, uh, for around 12, 13 years, I worked as an AI engineer, as a researcher in AI. So uh, this was a time when uh, it wasn't a marketing, uh, there wasn't a marketing buzz as around it, there was no money around it, you know no money in it, and uh, most of the money was in networking. So if you are a computer scientist in this room, you would know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so uh, let me start on a positive note here, uh, you know, uh, from the ITU perspective, from the UN perspective. For us, it's very clear, you know, AI has the potential, and I underline has the potential, uh, uh, to improve lives around the world in fundamental ways, and uh, in, it'll, it could play a major part in achieving the SDGs. Uh, I'm saying could and has the potential because there are significant challenges and we need to overcome those challenges before we get to where we need to be. Uh, but, but any area that you look in, you know, any area where you can have sufficient, uh, decent quality data or can have the means to collect that data, uh, AI can have an impact. It could be, you know, uh, health, uh, nutrition, accessibility for people with disabilities, transportation, poverty, many, many different areas. But again, these are just early days. We can see a lot more happen, a lot more good happen. 
but all this will happen only if we if we manage to come together to tackle the challenges and the challenges are very complex and multifaceted you've heard it uh, and you will be hearing it throughout the session and many other sessions you know there are ethical issues of course and these are issues uh, uh, that i'm hearing conversations within the un on uh, ethical issues of course you know ensuring ethical conduct from autonomous uh, ai systems avoiding unfair bias in AI systems, concerns about privacy, about identifying liability. There's this whole other topic about uh, lethal autonomous weapons. You know, there's a GG, a governmental group of experts uh, meeting. Uh, there's an organization called the UNODA, Office of Disarmament Affairs, which manages that. It's uh, chaired by the Indian ambassador in Geneva, disarmament ambassador. So that's a, own se a whole separate process. There are technical challenges, and, and it's, it, you know, I, I, I'm. I'm uh, trying to give a category to each of these challenges, but all these are interrelated. So technical challenges, you know, ensuring algorithmic transparency is something which comes up uh, all the time. Data challenges, uh, ensuring security if you're using AI for mission critical applications. Then there's the big uh, transformational socioeconomic challenges, of course. Uh, ensuring that uh, the developing countries don't get marginalized. Uh, especially those who have a large part of their uh, population unconnected. You know, you still have less than 50% uh, of the world connected. Uh, you have, uh, you know, you want to make sure that the social and gender inequalities are not amplified. And there's the component about jobs, of course, uh, social welfare systems, uh, uh, impact on social welfare systems, at least in the short to medium term. So uh, there's a big concern that uh, a more sophisticated form of digital divide is opening up and which would have uh, profound implications for uh, inequality globally. So at the UN, you know, the UN Secretary General has already termed this as a, a frontier issue. And he said uh, he's strongly committed to uh, promoting global cooperation on this emerging issue. Uh, at the AI for Good Summit that uh, ITU organized, I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little upon it uh, later. Uh, at that summit, uh, the UN Secretary General said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the UN stands ready to be a universal platform for discussion, and uh, together we need to make sure that AI uh, is used to enhance human dignity and serve the global good. And this is, this is what uh, we should all strive for. Uh, so at the UN, from a, we are looking at it from a system-wide perspective not as individual agencies, even though we have a lot of work going on individually. Uh, so there are, uh, I would say there are uh, three angles uh, under which we are looking for, uh, looking at this topic. One is how should UN structure its response, of course. And some of the conversation I hear, uh, you know, of course, the number one is providing a platform for global multi-stakeholder dialogue. Uh, the AI for Good Summit that was organized in June is one instance of that. Uh, establishing an external panel of experts uh, to advise the UN on different facets. Uh, clearly, the expertise uh, uh, is outside the UN. We have uh, experience expertise, but you know, the top guys are outside the UN, and we recognize that. Uh, establishing an interagency collaborative mechanism, an internal one, uh, to kind of make sure that the agencies are coordinated. The second group, uh, you know, what research and review action should be undertaken. Uh, example, you know, reviewing the impact of uh, AI on current UN frameworks, or uh, having more evidence-based research on uh, social impact, including, uh, you know, the whole narrative on jobs, whether uh, there will be more jobs produced in the long term while we lose jobs in the medium term. You know, we, we talk about it, but we need more evidence. So uh, that's something that different agencies are looking at, especially the ILO. And the third set is, of course, capacity building, which, which will be key. Uh, you know, there's a big concern that uh, the whole discussion is being shaped in uh, some countries, some regions, and also uh, it, it's very clear, you know, we need to ensure a fair, equitable, non-discriminatory uh, non distribution of the benefits of AI, uh, and especially if we aim to support the implementation of the SDGs. So uh, different agencies are doing different things. Thank you, I'm done, almost. So different agencies are doing different things. At the ITU, we have organized the first AI for Good Summit uh, this June with 20 UN agencies uh, partnering with XPRIZE. Uh, some of the top guys in the world were there. Uh, you know, uh, representatives from uh, all stakeholders were there. This year, we plan to organize it, uh, sorry, next year, 2008. Uh, we'll have it uh, May 15 to the 17th of May, and we invite you to mark your calendars. Uh, there are other things we are doing, like uh, we have a focus group on machine learning and 5G, you know, uh, a lot of technical work. And if you look at other agencies, they also have a whole body of work. Uh, if you're interested, I'd be happy to explain it. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Pritam. And I think this was important because we should recognize that is is a positive force, actually. And that's good, Pritam, introduced 
it because we become too critical because we are talking about the problems of it. So basically, as a positive force, like industrialization was, we could not have done without industrialization. And now digitalization is like that. It is positive force greatly increases efficiencies in all areas. So this is what we are going to use in all areas, but our questions are also what to do with uh, its negative effects and how to make it equitable uh, and socially just. Uh, so the last speaker here is uh, Marvika Jaram, who is from the Digital Asia Hub, which uh, along with another, some other uh, organizations as a network have been working uh, on this area, and she will bring the different streams of these discussions which have been happening into this uh, workshop. Uh, Malvika, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I always feel this is one of those conversations that's very much like the old, you know, life of Brian, Monty Python thing for those of you who have as terrible a sense of humor as I do. Um, it's sort of like, you know, what have the Romans done for us? I always think it's the same sort of conversation with artificial intelligence. It's like, what can AI do? Well, yeah, of course, the roads, the planning, the transport, the sewage, the, you know, all of this. But apart from that, what has it done for us? And I feel in a lot of conversations, we're sort of veering towards that, that end of the thing where there are all these amazing capabilities, there's all this potential that could or hasn't yet been realized, but we really want to focus on the dark side of, you know, apart from all of those great achievements, like what is it really doing? And I think that's actually a really, really helpful space to be because I think it forces us to look at problem solving, it forces us to look at what things can go wrong, um, but I think many of us tend to live in that dark space uh, a lot longer. I think for me, what is really interesting is the conversations that AI is forcing um, from a social justice point of view. Uh, you have a robot like, or an AI like Sophia awarded citizenship in Saudi Arabia, and suddenly we're all discussing what rights normal people have who are not robots or AI um, in certain countries, which I think is a really powerful frame. Uh, saying, you know, are we suddenly treating them better than we're treating humans? Do they have rights that we don't have? Uh, and I know I think Joanna Bryson, who I see here, oh, uh, wrote this great blog post about how, you know, if we gave robots rights, we'd almost certainly do it unjustly. Um, so I think that's a really useful provocation in saying, in trying to think of what kind of rights we give AI or we give robots, uh, should we also be thinking about the rights we're not giving certain demographics or certain people in meat space? Um, I think the conversations around bias and discrimination, again, um, is a really sort of good feedback loop in terms of offline, online. I was teaching a class in Hong Kong last week, and some of my students came to me and said, yeah, we get all the risks, we understand what's terrifying about all of this, but look at us. When we walk into a store, or we walk into a bank, or we walk, try to enter a nightclub, we're discriminated because of the way we look without them knowing anything about us. Maybe online we have a chance of actually being treated fairly when they don't know anything about our attributes or what we look like or the fact that we're Chinese. So actually maybe offline is more discriminatory than online and maybe AI can actually help mask certain features or characteristics. Maybe it's a fairer space for us to be. And that, that, that was a really interesting uh, perspective. I think it's forcing us to have a conversation about skills, and I think it's a very fraught conversation because as with most things, the work, the emotional and physical labor of being digitally literate, of being included, of having access, is often visited on the people least able to do it. You're making people, for, you know, you're asking people to get literate when they're the ones that are being discriminated against. The platforms and the infrastructure are never asked to do things by default or by design or at the infrastructure level, yet the poorest, weakest, most marginalized are asked to perform the labor of being included and having uh, systems work in their favor. And I think that's another important conversation that this has triggered. Um, the conversation about innovation, I mean, Mishi was talking about how innovation trumps everything. And I see that a lot in Asia. We ran three conferences in Hong Kong, Seoul, and Tokyo. And it's very much the narrative, and you can see why, because a lot of countries see something like AI 
as a chance to leapfrog and catch up on phases of development that they've missed out on. And they sort of say, you know, we, we, we didn't participate in many other stages of the Industrial Revolution. Maybe this is going to free us. Maybe this is where we have competitive advantage. Maybe this is what we can turn our IT resources, which are significant. Maybe that's what we can turn them to now that the outsourcing boom is waning. So they see it as potential or an opportunity. And as I said, in another session we did um, just before this one, they see it as an opportunity to fill missing populations in countries that are aging, in countries that are not having um, as many children being born. They see something like this as filling a missing labor workforce uh, or jobs that people aren't doing or where countries have really strong immigration controls. They see it as a way of actually providing companionship, robots, help for older people that they would otherwise be having immigrants do. So I think, again, you know, those are all really interesting ways that it's playing out uh, and that have a, a link to equity. Um, I think it also brings up this question of what is algorithmically solvable. I mean, Parminder's talked about, you know, social and technical solutions, and sometimes we sort of swap them technical solutions to social problems and the other way around. Um, but I think it's really forcing us to think about what are we even using this in service of. Um, there was a great tweet storm that Arvind Narayanan kicked off about how when he was teaching a class at Princeton um, and they were trying to define fairness, people came up with 21 definitions of fairness. Uh, how do you encode that? You know, how do computer scientists engage with you know, nebulous ideas that as lawyers and policy makers, we're comfortable with having a multiplicity of definitions? How do you code these things into systems? Um, I think all of these have implications for equity. So I think just to end here, um, I would really urge us as a community to focus on what AI is really adding or subtracting from the social justice conversation because I think one of my pet peeves is we talk about AI, robotics, big data, analytics, statistics, as if they're all the same thing. I think we have a real sort of paucity and poverty of definitions and vocabulary, but I think we also run the risk when we come at it from different disciplines of mixing them all up and talking about them as if they're the same thing. Um, but I think that's why intersectionality really matters. Uh, you need the computer scientists and the lawyers and the humanities people in the same room talking about these. The fact that we're all here, the fact that all kinds of people who've never thought about AI are now suddenly working on AI speaks to how much of a game changer it is, how transformative it is. I almost think it's such a brain drain or a sort of time sink that all of us are focusing energy on AI when one year ago we weren't. Either our sponsors and funders are requiring us to add AI to a proposal for it to look current and interesting, or we feel it's actually touching every aspect of our life from Siri in our phone to how search engines are optimized, to what images we're shown, to how fake news works. We can't get away from it. So I'll sort of end with one of my favorite quotations from William Gibson, uh, you know, where he talks about the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So I think the sooner we stop talking about AI as if it's some future sort of potential that may or may not happen and realize it is here, it is now, it is embodied in the devices and products that we use, and it is something that we are part of, it's an ecosystem. Uh, Nishant Shah at a Rio conference we recently had talked about saying he didn't like this framing of AI and inclusion or AI and something else because we are actually part of it. We're within an AI ecosystem. We're actors, we're participants. We may not all have the same agency or choice, but it is an ecosystem that we're all inhabiting. Um, so I think the sooner we recognize that it's here and now and actually start working on solutions and partnerships that will yield real outcomes, um, I think it would be a great step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Malvika, and I think you added well to Pritam's take that we need to first recognize the opportunity and the great force that it is, and as I said in the opening uh, intervention, it will fundamentally change how all our human systems are organized, uh, from industry to governance to social relationships. So it's very powerful, and it will change it in this manner because it's useful. It's highly efficient, otherwise it wouldn't change it in this manner. Uh, but also, uh, slightly differing on 
what would be the role of the policy makers? Because there is always a constituency which is highly optimistic about it uh, uh, because they are the sellers of artificial intelligence, the owners of artificial intelligence. So there has to also be corresponding thinking about uh, what are the problems uh, with overselling of that uh, artificial intelligence because that balance is also required. And then when you see whether the balance is on this side or the other, uh, you need to make those uh, kind of interventions because policymakers and uh, social justice activists, uh, of course, always look at power. And if there's a power which is concentrated, there's always an abuse. And we should start talking about what kind of abuse and what should be needed uh, to <coughs> confront that abuse. If there was abuse in industrial capital getting concentrated, there were problems and we need to have mitigating policies in the industrial age. There were cap problems with intellectual property capital getting concentrated. There's a huge amount of work with that. And now there is an intelligence capital which is getting concentrated, which is very useful at the heart of whole human reorganization. But policymakers need to think that what is it that we have to add to what is already being done by the market to promote efficiency, which AI promotes in a manner like nothing does. And to add to what Malvika said, that future is already here, it's not just equally distributed. Uh, uh, some of us like to say that artificial intelligence is so, so hyper-efficient that we may have solved the problem of production. In economics, basically, there are two problems. One is of production, another is of distribution. And therefore, since the problem of production would, in theory, have been solved, we should focus a lot on the problem of distribution. And that's what equity and social justice is about. Now, I'll open this discussion to the room to also start uh, talking, yes sir, uh, talking about the kind of things we need to do. And quickly, I have just three things which comes to my mind as a conversation starter about actual things we can do to take control of the in artificial intelligence to serve social goods. One is whether since artificial intelligence has some defined targets uh, and task which it would have to be doing and it finds its own ways to do it, uh, whether in critical areas like health, transportation and so on, the regulators have to reach that level where they could uh, come up and say that these tasks and targets have to be integrated into the core intelligence of a transportation or a health system so that whenever the artificial machinery works, it does not just maximize the efficiency in that no narrow profit-minded manner, but also the social goods. And both Norbert and also Malvika talked about how can we code fairness into it. But I think we need to start figuring out how regu regulators can code fairness into regulation of uh, AI and give certain targets which have to be part of certain critical systems. Second part, and in this area also, there's a lot of research going on. The problem with artificial intelligence systems is that you really do not know why it did these things. And for example, if GDPR, the new uh, EU uh, privacy regulation, which has one provision that you have a right to know from an algorithm how a certain decision was taken, it's simply not applicable in case of artificial intelligence because the artificial intelligence cannot tell you how a decision has been taken. So whether we would like some part of artificial intelligence to be dedicated to kind of somehow start recording whatever it does, to put in human readable language the logic it uses to take its decision. It may be difficult, but there's a research going on uh, whether this kind of thing can be done because then we can audit the steps uh, artificial intelligence system took to take some decisions which could be socially unjust and therefore then audit it back and correct those uh, things. All this may add certain inefficiency to the system, but I think there, there has to be a trade-off whether we need, you know, better equity and better social outcomes, which could reduce efficiency of artificial intelligence, and that's a decision societies would take. And third issue is that artificial intelligence always tries to centralize. If IGF is being organized, it is better to have three, one coordination center rather than three coordination centers, because if you have to put in five units of intelligence in three places, it's better to put 15 units of intelligence in one place, because it's is it provides better coordination. And that's why you're seeing all digital industries have a high tendency to concentrate. So artificial intelligence has this centralizing tendency, but can we force it to decentralize in certain manners to certain extent so that even if we have rival platforms, of course, if it's more efficient, if in a city of Geneva, there's single transport company which owns all the data and would do things more 
efficiently. If there were three transport companies, there would be some sacrificing of efficiency, perhaps. But can we force a certain amount of decentralization, even at the expense of some efficiency, whether we can have, for example, uh, AI as a public good in some cases, there is a concept of open AI, which Elon Musk have used. So these are the kind of things we need to start thinking about. And I wanted to contribute these initial points uh, before we start a conversation. Uh, and the gentleman uh, there first. Uh, and we will take uh, about five uh, interventions first and then decide how we go forward with that. So. Yes, Boris Engelson, <coughs> a local and very, <coughs> very silly journalist freelance. The lady in blue has put the, her finger on what I consider a crucial question, but alas, a question without answer. Why don't we have, we, after two or three centuries of democracy, why haven't we implemented social justice and equity yet? It is not just for lack of robots to help the elderly lady to carry a bag. It is not for lack of data or iPad. It is, as she said, because we have too many definitions of equity and too many definitions of social justice. All the wars and revolution of the past two or three centuries are an outcome of too much, too many conflicting vision on what is equity and what is just and what is social. So it may be that robots will be able to fix the thing in tournaments and civil wars between robots and then we will enjoy the ultimate and best coding. It might create a very boring society. Uh, you will experience, I'm too old, but I think that this issue of is artificial intelligence able to supersede the different conflicting views of what is justice, equity, and social. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, please. Go ahead. I'd like to thank all the panelists for great, but especially the one who likes my blog. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to speak, though, to the uh, gentleman on the left, since uh, the first speaker uh, mentioned, sorry, for ca terrible catching the names. Um, th there was this problem that you said AI couldn't, uh, uh, my, my comment is almost the same, actually. You, I, AI can't optimize for social justice because that's not just a number. But this is a problem that, that we have, oh, that wasn't you, that was the chair, I'm sorry, okay. But that's a, that was a problem for us in general. We need to define f human flourishing better and economics better. Um, and, and yeah, so as several of the people have said, this is a problem for us in general. I think I'll stop there. Uh, please. My name is Jan Erbgut. Uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Geneva. Um, I think we need a lot more education in uh, what kind of systems they are uh, and then how to apply them and what it means to apply them. Um, even when the data is uh, unbiased, um, we can't be sure that a system to whom we don't give any rules will produce the correct rules. It just doesn't work. So if we want to have certain rules, then we have to give it to the system. And this is, of course, a, a difficult task because we have to first to define those rules. And we, if we can't define the rules, we can't expect a nice AI system to define them for us in a correct manner. It just doesn't work. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, please. Hello, uh, I'm Juliana. I'm from Brazil, and I'm here as part of Youth as IGF program. I have a question about the changes in labor force and labor markets. Uh, I come from the global south and most of the job force from my country is unqualified and artificial intelligence, as was mentioned here so many times, will affect deeply the forms of labor offered in the world. But the unqualified positions will definitely be the first ones to be taken by AI. As a consequence, the workers of the global south will be the first ones to be affected. And as, as everybody knows here, those workers or the countries where this, th those workers come from will not be the owners of these technologies. 
concluding, uh, how can we prevent AI to be more of a factor of inequality between the global north and the global south? Yes, uh, Martin Schmalzried from Families Europe. Maybe just a quick provocative answer to the first gentleman. Uh, there is an argument that we're not in a democracy. If you look at ancient Greek uh, writers like Aristotle, he considered democracy to be only via sorting. That is, citizens being chosen you know, by random and not by election. He called democracy the tyranny of the majority. Just a thought, maybe. So that may be a part of the answer. Um, <laughs> Well, no, you shouldn't, because I should, it's sorting. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but <laughs> but I, I think the, the larger point I had about AI is that it's, it's, and I think you pointed to that, the last point that you made, is it's fine when it's about production. And it's about effectiveness, uh, efficiency, and productivity. When it's about decision-making, about human behavior, then we shouldn't use AI at all, I would argue, because the only thing that AI can do is to examine human behavior and simply draw conclusions from that and not from a simulated 100 planets in parallel universes where you design utopian systems and see how that would affect human behavior. So it cannot, it cannot tell us what is good or what is bad. It just can't. Yeah. Thank you, Halit from Germany. <clears throat> and I only want to refer to a previous session held also two days ago for artificial intelligence and inclusion, because as you said, there are only social solutions to social problems. I don't necessarily agree with that, because we had also the categorization of we d that we have technical solutions to social problems and social pro solutions to technical problems. And I try to extend that to that we do also have technical solutions to technical problems and social so solutions to social problems. And I only want to refer to the other term. I would not necessarily say that artificial intelligence is the opposite of uh, natural intelligence, because that induces immediately that a zero-one relation between artificial and natural. Uh, but I do think that's much more uh, uh, fuzzy logic than only having a two side of flip coin. That, was, that comment was meant to refer to the origins of the word artificial intelligence. I totally agree that in practice, how it's going to be used going forward, the powerful applications of artificial intelligence systems will involve humans. It's humans who can make use of it, and they become more powerful or more effective at whatever their task is. Hello. Just a minute. You wanted to say something? No, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, to briefly address the point about uh, social problems and technical solutions. Uh, I see your point, but the thing is that we should not necessarily look at them separately. And I think Malavika gave an answer to that uh, quite, quite uh, concretely in the terms that we do not need to look this as separate things. If this is a social construct, we need to look at inclusion and at participation and, and at agency from within the system. And that involves the use of technology necessarily, but as, as within our agency as people within the system to change that system to the, to the betterment of all. Uh, yes, Stephen. Hello. Okay, I wanted to react to uh, your comment also that uh, artificial intelligence cannot uh, address social justice because unlike profit, it's not uh, calculable. But um, we can find metrics of social justice also, like indicator. We can work through metrics. Uh, it's like we and wealth, for instance, it's not a calculable. It's not a number, but we address wealth through uh, capital profit. And there are indicators, simple indicator would be the difference between rich and poor for social justice. Um, the problem is do we want to quantify everything? So that's another problem. But I think social justice can be calculated. Yeah, we come in here, and that's a main point. I think the, I understand the scientists and technologists are trained to think in that fashion. But we on the social and policy side, we know 
it's not only what is measurable which is important, but what is important is important for its own sake, whether it's measurable or not, and we need to figure out a trade-off. We cannot say we will only deal with things which are measurable and rest can go to hell because the best things in life may not be measurable, but we can still use economics, discipline does it, uh, econometric does it, so these are efforts to figure out some measurability about some important parts of life because and even if we lose efficiency because the matrices are not good, some things will still be included because they are the more important things, and that itself is uh, important uh, calculation. You were wanting to say something? Um, I, was, then, I was only trying to say is that um, the, the rise of the cryptocurrencies, which I'm sure nobody has missed out, uh, but if you go back to 2008 and 2009, when Satoshi actually starts doing, or the group of people, which is Satoshi, I do not know who that is, but when they start doing it, it emphasizes this increasing trust in code and technology over human-created systems. The financial institutions, the governments, all the policy, all everybody, the economists who actually told us that there is more trust in this rational human being, which also has been destroyed as a theory, had failed everybody, and the bankers had done, and everybody knows what happened in the subprime mortgage cases, they failed us, and there is an increased tendency in, a lar in large swaths of human population to say, these guys, the tech is predictable. The human judgment is greedy and unpredictable. So the phenomenon we are observing is more and more trust there. And that's why it's easy for the governments to sell the narrative of everything else is subservient to innovation, and that anyway leads to far more predictability in the behavior of their own populations. And anyway, what is democracy? Um, because if everything is going to be now uh, fine-tuned and changed, by, by algorithms, then everything else is up for, this, up for the grabs, and the human society is now changing. So that's all I wanted to say, that the larger phenomenon should not be ignored, uh, because that's how many of the people are currently thinking. Um, thank you. Um, my comments actually um, somehow related uh, to this, and also following up on the point of, of innovation. Um, and the financial crisis, because I was wondering to what extent, and this is a question for also all the panelists, um, if you had some thoughts on how the current economic capitalist pressures that influence the different developments of, of those, uh, and the, like the, the AI and the, how the pressures on the companies, how that influences what types of products that they come up with and how they shape and how they move around, right? This like the competition between the different companies that they want to be first and whether, in our reactions and like trying to like come up with solutions and what could be done, whether thinking about different business models or different approaches that are kind of, that go a little bit counter to that, um, that pressure and like that, that, that competition and something that is maybe a little bit more open, something along the lines of previous uh, initiatives around creative commons and like copy left approaches, if you've had some in thoughts and ideas on, on all of that. So, okay, I'll give you on the panel quickly a minute and a half each at the end of it, but we still have time. And Thank you. It's been fascinating for me listening to this because everything that I've been reading is warning against the fact that AI reflects the biases that we see in our society. As a woman of color, if you're interacting with a system which has been trained by somebody who is not a woman of color, you can expect that you will pick up some biases. This idea that governments feel that um, technology is neutral, uh, you're, you're coming out and saying they're worried about human systems, they have more faith in tech systems. This is what I heard you say. Oh, I actually said um, the citizenry is now showing more faith in code and tech, not just the governments. And uh, that's why... Well, I don't know about that. Maybe I read the wrong stuff. Um, because that's not what I'm feeling at all. I mean, if you look at the discussion, you're looking at major platform companies, the oligarchs, as we call them, 
and citizenry is becoming more and more nervous about the control. Oh, I'm that, with you on that. Yes. <laughs> no, Tremendous but if you talk about algorithms and their control over data and over your lives, you're talking about AI as, as well. You know, so I think that I was getting some contradictory signals from what was being said on the panel. But essentially, we see that the systems that we have created will reflect who we are. And we haven't got to the stage yet where we can insulate them from that. Uh, thank you. And I just want to add one point because uh, that's the political economy and we try to bring a political economy approach to it. People talk about biases, but it's not just biases because biases look like something which if I'm given the right information, I'll correct. There are also interests embedded in yes. AI mm. and interests are different from biases. Yes. Interests are deliberate, biases are not deliberate. And we like to talk only about biases if, as if, if everybody had the right information, mm. they'll correct themselves. But here, mm -hmm. interests are integrated by the controllers of the technology and that's- yes. Let me just make one more point, sorry. I forgot the point on <laughs> innovation. What I've been reading is innovation is dangled out as the reward for no regulation in this space. Yeah. So I see that as being a company um, narrative, uh, you know, big business narrative to leave them in peace. I don't see that necessarily as a developing country narrative, which is what I was getting from oh, you. Oh, that, uh, that, yeah. that's one thing which I will actually disagree. The other things I am with you. I think you're right. For the longest time, it was dangled as the innovative thing. But what has happened now, the government narrative has bought into it. The public-private partnerships, I'll tell about my own government, where I come from, India, where it's been now the data-based innovation is the biggest thing which most company, which most governments now want to bank upon. Look at the countries like the Republic of China, um, a very different, of course, a very different economy, a very different political structure, but everybody now wants a share in what tech-based innovation, which is going to be riding on the wave of data, is able to offer their citizens. The price may be democracy and the price may be various other values which we may hold very dear to us after all the struggle, but innovation is not just being now used by companies. It's, it's, it's very interesting, but uh, yes, they would also like to move fast and break things. Um, India has a biometric database which we are ready to export to everybody else because we think we are very innovative and every other concern, whether it's data protection or privacy, et cetera, becomes somewhat of um, a, a difficulty or an inconvenient issue. So, yeah. it's happening. Uh, so, yeah, why, why, before I go to the questions, uh, people who have been silent on the panel, if they want to take uh, any, make any points, they can do it. I'll yeah. give you the opportunity right after this question. Uh, the person three short of the last one, yeah, you. Me. And then the last Thank one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up a, a comment made by the chair um, um, as you were, in a sense, summing up what the panel was saying uh, as they first finished speaking, which was about the concentration of power. And I think that's an extremely important issue to have on the table. Um, uh, you mentioned the concentration of power in terms of, you know, in historically in terms of a number of episodes in human history. You can see it obviously in capital, as you mentioned, but also in terms of control of land before that, um, and the backlash always being towards uh, demand for accountability and towards some kind of redistribution of, in a sense, um, perhaps articulated through access to resources, but in itself it's about actually um, perhaps a redistribution of power itself um, manifested through redistribution of resources in some way. Um, and I think that's an important point to hold on to because I think what we're, what some of these issues appear to take the analysis of what happens in terms of the concentration of power out of the equation, make it into something, um, in a sense, apparently non-ideological, such as efficiency, apparently non-ideological, such as innovation and technological achievement. And in fact, these concepts are fundamentally ideological concepts as well. I mean, efficiency is an ideological concept. 
I mean, we can want to do things better, but what we define as how we do it better is, in a sense, the, that, that is, you know, how we approach that is a human value that's being put on it, um, with power embedded within it. So I do think that the uh, conversations around AI, if they do not um, embed this kind of very fundamental, in a sense, analysis around the political economy in which it's operating, um, or is it is uh, and is reproducing and I think the important it's not just reflection it is reproduction um, and change in terms of decision making through AI systems if there isn't accountability in some way embedded into it then uh, you know we we, we or, or rather we need to think about how to embed accountability into it uh, amidst all the very positive elements that there are in AI I need to go to another session so I'm going to be very quick um, I think Sort of picking up on your point, one thing I wanted to say was, what expectations do we have of AI? Do we want it to accurately reflect reality? Are we imposing an aspirational element of it being better than reality because reality is messy and screwed up and biased? So do we expect technology to actually deliver us from that and actually give us something better? And in doing so, how do we do that? And are we going to run up against all the problems we've had with attempts to do affirmative action and the backlashes that result from that. So are there good ways to do that? I think that's a very fruitful exercise for this community to say, what does that look like? Who are the actors who gets to sort of shape that discourse? Because I mean, we've seen it with sort of, you know, Me Too, with every other campaign where we talk about, where we sort of surface discrimination, that there's always this backlash. Um, so what is a good way for AI to actually help with that? Um, and like Parminda was talking about, you know, if it's, a, if it's a data issue, we know how to counter that. You know, if we know the slice of data we're dealing with is not representative, there are techniques to actually you know, normalize for that and actually make the data more representative. Um, so I think there are things. I think one of the ways, I, I, I think a lot of our discourse in this space focuses very heavily on forms of AI that are data intensive. But there are techniques like reinforcement learning that actually function in a vacuum of data and humans where the system learns against itself, like AlphaGo Zero, the new variation, which didn't learn from exposure to lots of old Go games. It learned by playing against itself. So does, that, does something like that, which is not so reliant on data, does it help us actually escape some of these questions of bias? Uh, and should we, of course, it'll throw up inevitably new questions uh, of social justice that don't come up from the data perspective, but they could be solutions to some of the data questions. Um, and I, just to end, I wanted to say that, you know, we talk about transparency as sort of one of the big goals here, but should we be actually looking for proxies where a system is inscrutable or algorithmic, you know, explainability isn't possible because the system wrote a system which wrote a system which, God, you know, God help you if you know how it actually works. Are there proxies for fairness? Are there other things we can look at? Um, are there ways that you can audit it? And who actually audits these systems? Are there other sort of accountability measures that, f that can work with transparency where transparency falls short and where it's not imposing burdens on the, on the users and the victims, but can actually put some pressure on players and um, at the design level? So I, was, I wish we could talk about this for hours, but I need to go and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you for coming. I know she was rushing to another workshop. Uh, she will leave us now, and uh, the person at the end, and then you as so. Hi, um, Johnny Penn, University of Cambridge. Um, I like the expression, the poverty of vocabulary, and I just wanted to add, for what it was worth, um, a shout out for the historians of technology who are trying to chart some of the history of how we've arrived at this point and unpack the ideology behind things like efficiency. Uh, you can Google the maintainers or go to maintainers.org to see some of their where their work and it's trying to offer a uh, counterbalance to move fast and break things and by saying move slow and fix things um, and offering offering maintaining technology uh, and the, the influence that that has over a society as a, as a kind of uh, balance counterbalance to the idea that innovation drives progress um, or innovate or that progress is all that important um, also quick practicality thing you know from my view, I think the on-ramp for data literacy for civil society is still pretty, you know, th these would be actually good problems to have. I don't see many civil society groups with the budget to, to capture data, to know what to do with data. And I, I just want to echo a point made by a, a woman over here about the need to maybe congregate around uh, uh, 
data policy. You know, we're in the United Nations. This is a place where people meet to discuss best practices. Is there an equivalent to the United Nations for data uh, that civil society can 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 cumulate, can gain by working together? Um, yeah, and this is a wonderful panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, you sir. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> I just wanted to, to go into the distinction between uh, AI and blockchain. They are not the same, they are the, the opposite. Uh, AI, don't trust it, there are no rules. Um, it's just learning by example and making up the, their own rules. Uh, they, it learns your examples and everything between those examples is just interpolation which might be good or might not be good. Blockchain on the other hand is very simple it's um, clear rules, everything is transparent, and you can trust it, that's what it, it's made for. So AI for complex problems, blockchain for simple problems, but trust. So we, we need really to look at what kind of technology we are looking at and see where we can em employ it and where we can't. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree that basically, it's not technology, somebody said there are technical solutions I think definitionally a solution is social. It cannot be technical, but we can get into that definitions later on. But I think technologies contribute to making new institutions and new social systems. As you were saying, there, is, there are complex technologies and less complex technologies, and combining them together, we can make financial systems, we can make governance systems, we can make other kind of data systems, which, which kind of carry forward our social objectives. And depending on what our social objectives are, we can combine different kind of technologies. So I think social is always ahead of technologies and I can't see anything being technical being ahead of uh, social, but that is a long uh, discussion many, many disciplines uh, enter into. Uh, so are there any other inputs? Otherwise I go back to the panel. Anybody wants to make last two interventions? Uh, yeah, so yeah, we have uh, six minutes. Uh, so I'll, if nobody else uh, is speaking, I'll, uh, a quick one uh, and I'll go back to the panel. Uh, and the panelists can start from there and choose whatever points they want to speak about, just about a minute uh, each left. Oh, thank you very much. I'm a neuro programmer. Um, I just have a question. Who is going to push AI or artificial consciousness uh, developers or developers of bots, the companies? to be more transparent in their softwares. So if UN has not yet consensus a definition of bioethical artificial consciousness, this is gonna be cyber unsafe if, there <coughs> if we have a robot like Sophia robot speaking in the UN or making decisions or participating. Thank you, so uh, I would, uh, First, give chance to those speakers who did not intervene during the interventions. Uh, about a minute each, uh, Pritam, then Norbert, uh, and uh, then Carlos, uh, please. And then Michi and myself, if there is any time left. Okay, uh, thanks. So, uh, hearing the conversation, uh, you know, some of these issues have come up so many times that, uh, at least according to me, I think there is a need to demystify AI. For example, I heard uh, Parminder say, and, and that's largely true, uh, that AI is a black box, you don't know what it's doing, uh, so it's uh, very difficult to kind of uh, trace it. So putting my technology hat, uh, you know, that's true for neural nets and deep learning algorithms. You know, it's a particular kind of AI, but there are Bayesian networks, there are decision trees. Decision tree, by definition, you know, it is a tree. So when you train the algorithm, you can actually see, you can print it out as a tree support vector machines, you know, Kate, nearing, uh, Kate nearest neighbor, clustering algorithms. There are different classes of algorithms where traceability is not that difficult, you know. And these kinds of algorithms are used for uh, natural language processing, for speech recognition, it was hidden Marco, but it couldn't, even that could be traced. You know, so uh, let's not put everything in one basket and say that we don't know what's happening. You know, let, let's understand what the different uh, uh, techniques are, what the technology is, and then try to figure out a solution for everything. Because then, the, or else the worry is you're always aiming for a doomsday scenario, and uh, you're always concerned uh, without knowing what you're concerned about, you know. So it's just a general point I'm making. And I just wanted to close by, uh, you know, re-quoting Tim Cook, whom I heard at uh, the Wujin conference in uh, China the week before last, I think. 
And, and uh, he said something along the lines of, uh, he's not worried about uh, machines thinking like humans. He's more worried about humans thinking like machines. So I'll just leave it out there. Yes, very briefly to, to end. Yes, there is a strong urge to out-innovate and to outpace the rest. And the inefficiencies of democracy or taking values into account tend to slow down those processes so they become barriers for states and, and for capital, for power in general, to promote this kind of, of growth uh, without caring about the distribution of the growth. Um, however, we were not going to, to stop that necessarily by just mentioning it. it. And it's important then to be involved in those processes. Malavika and Mishi have mentioned that. So to encourage participation in the design and, and in, the, in requesting transparency and accountability and updating mechanisms is necessary. But it's all within the larger framework of society trying to make better conditions for itself. It's good to participate in that standard setting because that sets the rules for the game for, for the future. However, because this is the reality now, it is a current call upon now to be participants in those processes without leaving uh, aside all the other questions that appeared during the panel about democracy, about uh, being participants, about highlighting some values and bringing them into these conversations and also to contest and challenge and correct the results of the use of technology when that might not uh, go towards what we consider as social justice. Thank you. I would like to highlight one point, which is the difference between social justice and social justice indicators, which of course each are an important aspect. And I believe it also addresses the question asked at the very end, at least to some extent, I'm going to quote from one of the major human rights treaties, Article 25A of the ICCPR. Every citizen, every citizen shall have the right and opportunity to take part in the conduct of public affairs. And defining what an AI algorithm should do is becoming, at least for the big applications, a matter of public affairs. So we have the right, we must demand our human rights to take part in these public affairs. We need a seat at the decision-making table where that is decided. That's not just for the techies and those big companies, it's for us. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert. Uh, Michi, we both have still time, about half a minute. <laughs> um, I just want to say that um, I agreed with Pritam about what is um, the segregation and uh, the triage and understanding of terms is a little important, but I do want to concentrate on one simple thing. I think um, in future when we look at, it's not just the lower skilled labor which is, which is seeing um, at, at least a little bit of changes in what the new jobs will bring, bring but it's also at the very expert level, which requires kind of precision. And there's a lot of other kind of benefits which are coming up. You all saw perhaps Kepler, the new exoplanet which we discovered two days ago with the help of Google Neural Network. Um, these are great benefits which we have. It's for the first time in after the Industrial Revolution, we exactly can predict which are the kind of injuries we have when production happens and can make work safer. And also about education, just to make education effective, which I think has been an endeavor of the human society, which will ultimately lead to all kinds of benefits later on. To make schooling more effective, edX is already doing it, and proprietary software companies like Coursera are already deploying it, but it's also time to do it for ourselves and our schools, which is the benefit coming out of it. I cannot emphasize enough that uh, more participation or at least even an attempt to understand all the issues just makes it a little more better than somebody just telling you the top-down approach that this is how the tech works. It said, uh, I think Mozilla's health report of internet says 52% of the websites on the internet are in English, but only 25% of the world's population speaks English. And that also tells you the disparity between what is now being taught to us compared to what we want to learn. And let it not come as a later afterthought of Band-Aid that this is the kind of policy you would like, but just participation, talking, and interest, getting interested and in improving our own education. Uh, thank you, Mishi. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh,
we may not have been able to answer some of the questions, but the questions were important inputs in themselves. Uh, thank you very much for a very participative uh, walk out here. I just want to add to what Mishi said that we want to continue this work. We do not want equity and social justice to be a residual addition to when the new digital systems around artificial intelligence have been set up. We want these to be a part of the design and we are in formative phases of an artificial intelligence powered society. And therefore we want to carry on this dialogue, whether we are able to code social justice or not, or do it inefficiently or in doing so, reduce the efficiencies of the systems a bit, which I always think it does happen, but we should have to take that trade off. So we want to continue this dialogue. Those who are interested in continuing this dialogue can either go to JustNet Coalition website or it for change website, uh, and there is a uh, general um, email ID there and write to us. We would carry on as a group trying to figure out and bring it back to the next IGF, possibly also as a dynamic coalition, but in some kind of a grouping, which will carry on an effort to see that equity and social justice is part of the new systems and not added to them later on. And thank you, everybody, and thank you, the panelists, so much. You did it before I did it. Now you do it, because no, no. until the chair does it's it. Over. It's but over. Says until you say it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The meeting is closed. And I know I would not speak, because yeah. before I came to the room, it seemed you said more or less the same in a more articulate Not at all, sir. Yeah. Very much good uh, contribution. And I think democracy is achieving a lot. For a poor country like India, also, we are so